Hi, my name is John Wargo. I uh, picked up a last minute topic to cover for you guys today. Um, I'm going to talk about the state of mobile development, at least kind of my, my view of it. Uh, how many here are mobile developers? How many here want to be mobile developers? How many play mobile developers on television? All right, well, let's, let's go through this. I've got like 200, 250 slides, so um, we'll, we'll be busy. So this is me. Uh, I'm at John Wargo on Twitter. I'm a software developer, husband, geek, whatever. I'm a principal program manager at Microsoft. I work on the team that, um, that does Visual Studio Mobile Center. How many people have ever heard of Visual Studio Mobile Center? A couple Microsoft employees and a couple non microsoft Nice. Anyways, I'm happy to talk about it at length uh, elsewhere, but basically it's an a, a Azure-based service for managing build, test, and deploy for mobile apps. And then I'm actually working on adding MBAS capabilities to that as well. And I'm happy to explain MBAS later. <coughs> Um, I'm also responsible for the JavaScript tooling that Microsoft has. So the Visual Studio Code extensions for React Native and Cordova development. So that's me. And I've written a few books um, just because I wrote, so I wrote the first book on BlackBerry development. <coughs> Didn't make me a lot of money. Um, wrote a very popular book on, uh, on PhoneGap, which at the time was called PhoneGap and it became Apache Cordova. What was cool was that one got, whoops. That one got translated to uh, Chinese, went to Korean, not bad. And then, of course, shamelessly, I just rewrote it for Apache Cordova 3, um, split part of it out for another book, and then I rewrote it again for Apache Cordova 4. So I have four books in Apache Cordova. It's one book redone three times, so <laughs> nothing amazing. Um, I also wrote a whole bunch of articles on all the possible ways to mobilize IBM Lotus Notes and Domino. Have you ever heard of it? Um, that became a, a book. They took all the articles and made a book out of it, so pretty cool. And I'm also the only author in the world that's written a book on mobile development and football refereeing. <laughs> Long story. All right, so I want to talk about mobile, where it is and kind of where it's going. This is just my myopic view, so uh, kind of how I see it. I could be wrong. Feel free to disagree with me, okay? If you want to disagree with me on Twitter space, fine, but if you want to disagree with me here, that'd be better because then everybody benefits from the conversation. But uh, this is my view. So a question for you. First smartphone, when? Was it 2007? Thank you. So many people in America believe that the first smartphone was the iPhone. No. So we had um, this first one, which was IBM, 1992. This is what it looked like. And then the first actual commercial smartphone was this one, the Ericsson. Okay, which was 99, if I remember correctly. And then, of course, this is the first one I had. So it was a BlackBerry device. All right? Uh, the ability to build apps, right, browse the web, and so on. Interestingly, though, so you could, you could run web apps here, right? So use a mobile browser. You could do Java ME apps if you wanted to. But the DOM was read-only. Can you imagine the world with a read-only DOM in the web? Anybody, can you imagine that? All of you are young enough, right, that, that the whole interactive Web 2.0 and all of these frameworks that manipulate the heck out of the DOM, right? Well, on the BlackBerry, for performance reasons, the DOM was read, I would say read blank only, but read only. It was crazy. Anyways, so in the beginning, mobile apps were native apps. So context, calendar, email, right? And then developers could extend those apps, but they generally didn't, right? Because proprietary platforms, proprietary tools, Every platform had a completely different SDK, completely different language. It was a nightmare, and so nobody did it. Unfortunately, that's not very different from today, except that everyone's doing it, right? You still have completely different SDKs, completely different languages, but there's a lot of money in it, so therefore people are doing it. Um, the web was for browsing, not for apps. So the original smartphones were back in a day when you didn't have web apps, you had web browsers, okay? And then, uh, Later, Air, Apple arrogantly told you, you don't need apps, just for everything in the web. Um, how many were around in 2007 when there was this big revolt where Apple said, just build web apps, and the whole community said, no, we want to do native apps, and they said, okay. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so going forward, or kind of how things are today, uh, requirements for mobile apps are that um, you got to have an app in the app store. So if you're a business and you're doing either business online or you have some sort of following, you have to have an app in the App Store. If you don't, people just immediately discount you, okay? But you also have to have 
a website in order to be able to accommodate people that either don't, haven't installed your app yet or are not going to install your app. Okay? So kind of no matter what, you're still going to have to do web, mobile web most likely, and some sort of native app. Okay? And um, <clears throat> depending upon your product, what your web presence may be is either going to be some sort of portal kind of describing your product or it's going to be an exact duplicate of the capabilities in your mobile app. It just depends on what your public face is for your product or service or whatever. So I want to start talking about some different technologies that you'll use to build, that are available to help you build mobile apps, okay? So the first one is something called, um, oh wait, sorry, so, um, yeah, so that's the mobile apps. And then there's this thing called PhoneGap, or Apache Cordova, which I've written a bunch about, which gives you the ability to build web apps, but run those web apps inside a native application container. And then when you want to access native capabilities, use plugins to do that. And one of the things that they did, and when they built their framework, they started their project, was they deliberately um, built the project with the understanding that they were going to make themselves obsolete. So their goal from the very beginning of starting the open source project was to make themselves obsolete. So the idea being that you have native apps. If you want to have cross-platform apps, one of the easiest ways to do that is with the web. Okay, Cordova gave you the ability to access native APIs from a web app. But then ultimately the expectation was the web would evolve to a point where you could have rich, robust, native looking apps in the web, which we have today. And then the standard capabilities in a mobile phone that are needed in an app, so camera, accelerometer, compass, file system, what else? There's a couple of things. That those capabilities would eventually find their way into the browser and then Cordova would no longer need to exist. The good news is we've gotten there. So when we talk about mobile apps, mobile apps are generally built with, by different teams within the organization. <clears throat> so there's a web team, there's an Android team, there's an iOS team. There might be a Windows team. Um, don't laugh. <laughs> Did I mention I work for Microsoft? <laughs> um, so, but ultimately what we see in the market is that there's this incredible drive towards having cross-platform tools but at the end of the day, if you're doing native, you have to, absolutely have to do work with four diff completely different sets of technologies, or at least three, or maybe two. All right, so when you look at development organizations, the, the enterprise development organization looks a little different than the consumer development organization. And the reason why I bring that up is because I think most of you are in college or university, and you haven't had a chance to experience the real world, but from everything that I think you're seeing is that there's these small, really cool, hip development shops with beanbag chairs and scooters that you can go from room to room, and there's a, people doing really cool stuff with Android development and iOS development. But on the enterprise, it's different. The enterprise, and by enterprise I mean big companies building stuff for their employees instead of small to medium companies building things for their customers, or even large companies building stuff for their customers. Enterprises have different needs, different requirements, okay? They care more about cross-platform development than the independent developer because they want to um, streamline their time to market. So they want to more efficiently get apps out in the market. And they also want to build them less expensively. And so the reason why I bring that up is you've got two different ways of looking at development. You've got, I've got to build something really cool that's got to be fast, engaging, and useful and so in order to do that, I need a designer, and I need native developers. And then the other side of things, which is, hey, I need to enable my workforce to more efficiently do the jobs while on the road. An app being beautiful doesn't matter. The app being native doesn't necessarily matter. What matters is how quickly can I get my employees to the data they need as quickly as possible. Okay, so that's kind of my view of this. So on the consumer app side, um, there's an expectation that you have a mobile first world. So an, an application that, ex that appears in the market is gonna appear for mobile first. On the enterprise side, chances are there's an existing desktop app or an existing web app that is then being implemented mobile second, okay? Um, and then any new apps that come out. So if you look at the major corporations, they've made announcements that going forward, we're a mobile first company. And that means both for the public facing stuff and the internal stuff. So if they build a new app, it goes out on mobile first. And if it happens to work on the desktop, then fine. 
right? So they're, they're willing to make the investment to make sure it's as mobile friendly as possible. And if you're not mobile, if you're at your laptop or if you're at your desk, eh, it might work okay. Does that make sense? All right. Ooh, someone said yes. I like that. All right. So ultimately, <clears throat> except for that native only kind of world that I was talking about, ultimately what a lot of organizations want is cross-platform development solutions. So the ability to build once, run many, okay? It's never good. Trust me when I say it, it never works. I'm just kidding, it can, but it's challenging. Um, the idea is that you're primarily running the same app on Android and iOS, you may be running it elsewhere as well. Okay, so that's kind of the way I see mobile being um, is that they want economies of scale. You want to be able to minimize your development. You don't want to have two sets of developers. You want one set of developer building apps for multiple platforms. And so to accommodate that, there's, there's multiple ways to build these mobile apps. So <clears throat> we've got the web, which by very nature is cross-platform. We've got native, which as I've described before, by its very nature is not cross-platform. We've got hybrid, which is the Apache Cordova stuff I just talked about, and I'll talk about it more in a minute. And then we have something called JavaScript-driven native. Have you guys heard of that? So JavaScript-driven native is things like React Native. Um, I'm going to talk about some other solutions as well. There's also something that I call adjacent native. Uh, for those of you that at the conference yesterday, when you look at Flutter, what they're doing with the native compilation from a Dart app, that's kind of the thing, where you, you build an app in one technology, Dart, for example, or JavaScript, or C Sharp, and some technology is used to transpile or compile or do something to that code to make it run in on Android, iOS, Windows, whatever. Traditionally, there's some sort of intermediate language. Um, in some cases, it's actually compiled to the target OS, but you didn't write the app in that target language. Okay, so that's what adjacent native is. And then the last one is mobile application platforms. Um, Gartner coined a few ter terms. Gartner is an analyst firm. Um, Meet mobile enterprise application platforms. MCAP, Mobile Consumer Application Platforms. Everyone decided that was too complicated, so now we have MADP, Mobile Application Development Platforms. And the idea there is that you've got some sort of tool <clears throat> that you use to design an app, and then it uses some sort of cross-platform technology to run in a multiple devices. Now, I'll talk about that in a little bit. I've still got like 200 slides to go, so I'll get to it. All right, so the first one's Apache Cordova, and this is the one I know the most because that's where I've, I wrote four books on it, right? <clears throat> Apache Cordova basically is an open source project designed specifically to make itself obsolete. Basically, the idea is you build cross-platform mobile apps using the browser, okay? Um, what, what's interesting, what came out of this was several mobile-specific JavaScript frameworks, UI frameworks, that enabled you to actually build a web app that looks and feels like a native app, run it in Apache Cordova, the Cordova app has access to the, um, the native APIs, and it can look and feel and act like a native app. So because of that, it's very popular. Um, the way it works is you build uh, your app, JavaScript, uh, CSS, HTML. You run it through some sort of compilation process, which packages the web content and then stores it inside a native app. And it runs basically when the app loads, loads a web view, the web content runs in the web view. The reason why I did this was so that you recognize that it's not actually any type of cross compilation or anything, no transpilation. Um, the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript does not get recompiled into Objective-C or Java or Kotlin. It's not happening. Um, there's an architecture that says basically, here's my web app. It's running in this web view. And then there's this plugin architecture that gives me access to native capabilities. The Cordova team publishes a, team, um, a set of core plugins that cover compass, accelerometer, address book, things like that. And then if you need some extra API that the Cordova team doesn't cover, you write your own plugin, exposes that API through a JavaScript bridge, and away you go. And so it's, it's a very popular way to build cross-platform mobile apps. Remember when I talked about those um, mobile application platforms that the enterprises use? Those are traditionally, um, that's the way those products typically deploy a mobile app is through a Cordova app under the covers. Okay, so anyways. Um, and then Cordova is just the web piece of it and people started to really actively complain about how do I get a native look and feel to my app and so multiple frameworks popped up. One of the most popular is something called Ionic. Ionic is a Angular-based framework 
that uh, allows you to build native look and feel in a web app using Angular and some other technologies, deploy them in a Cordova app, and then you have an app that looks and feels like native, uh, most users would not be able to tell the difference. What kind of surprised me the previous two days, nobody mentioned anything about Ionic. They talked about Angular and talked about React Native, but this was not a technology that was ever mentioned. But it's really pretty powerful. Um, they're changing their approach, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about at the end. Um, but it's really pretty cool what they're doing. Uh, the next piece of this is React Native. Has everyone heard of React Native? Yeah, I'm assuming if you're here, you've known about that. Um, the idea is that you build, you write a bunch of JavaScript, use some proprietary stuff called JSX, which allows you to render native UI components, and then you have a JavaScript app, but it is actually a native app on the device. So that's JavaScript driven native. And then there's a variant to this that I imagine many of you have never heard of. It's called NativeScript. So there's another open source project called NativeScript, which allows you to build native mobile applications using JavaScript code. You basically um, build an XML file that describes the UI you want, so I identify the components and where they're placed. At runtime, the JavaScript code, or the code within the runtime container analyzes that XML, creates the necessary native components, and then your business logic is all written in JavaScript. So there's a JavaScript interpreter, basically, that interacts with the UI and implements all your business logic and so on. So it's kind of cool. Um, you know, the two, so React Native is uh, funded by space, uh, Facebook, so it's Facebook's project. And basically, because of who they are and what they are, it's going to get a lot of attention. So going forward, you'll hear me say that most mobile apps are going to be React Native apps going forward. Um, these guys consider themselves React Native for the enterprise. The difference is, Native Script, you can access any native API directly from JavaScript. They've implemented this patented technology that allows you to just call an API arbitrarily. Um, Apple's not too excited about that, but it, but it works. Um, and then they thought that they were going to keep some longevity because of Facebook's license agreement for React Native. But about two or three weeks ago, that license agreement changed. So before, it was prohibitive for enterprises to use React and React Native because of the licensing agreement. That restriction's gone. So I only imagine uh, React Native is going to take off, and these guys are going to probably die a horrible death. You guys heard of Xamarin? Xamarin, anyone heard of Xamarin? So an open source project uh, bought by Microsoft, free, open source today, um, allows you to write one application in C Sharp and then execute that application natively on both Android and iOS and Windows. But you can already do C Sharp and Windows, so that's not important. Right? Um, really cool technology. It was a commercial product, and then Microsoft bought Xamarin, and then two minutes, literally two minutes later, open sourced the whole thing. So really pretty powerful. All right. And then the mobile application platforms. Um, I mentioned here that there's hundreds of them. Actually, there's thousands of them. Um, there are literally thousands of companies that have built these really cool designer tools, allow you to design an application that looks and feels like a native app, and then you click a button, and it either spits out a native app, spits out a Cordova app, spits out a web app, spits out um, many of these companies are migrating to React Native. And so ultimately, you have the ability, and this is primarily used by enterprises, to design an app using real design tools, and then deploy it on the web and other platforms as well. So you're not going to see this used in the consumer space. You're not going to see Facebook buy a license to this tool and use it for the Facebook client or Coca-Cola or whoever. But you are going to see enterprises using it for their employees. You're also going to see it being used heavily for um, lightweight consumer apps for businesses that you probably haven't heard of before. Make sense? All right. You're still awake. That's good. So when you use these mobile application platforms, you're going to sacrifice. You're going to make some sacrifice because you're not writing native code, okay? And you're using a designer that abstracts away the pixel perfect stuff that you're used to doing for native, okay? So if you take this approach, understand that there's some limitations. And then you're sticking yourself with a vendor. So you've got vendor lock-in. You've got license agreements. You're going to pay every year for as long as you run your app. And so for those reasons, not that exciting. So the, the main point of all this is you know, what's happening now. And so I want to talk from here kind of about the current state of things in the future in the eight minutes that I have left. So the one thing that was really not talked about this week at all was, again, surprised me, is progressive web apps. So are you guys familiar with progressive web apps? So there's some new technologies 
or there's some relatively new packaging of technologies that enable you to build a web app that kind of feels more like a native app. So the ability to throw a home screen icon, have an icon associated with it, cache content, which increases startup time and so on. This is kind of changing the world, at least the part of the world that I spend most of my time in. Um, Apache Cordova is in the process of migrating all of their existing plugins to web standards. And then the rest of the world is waiting for Apple. And what I mean by that is, I mentioned early on that the Cordova team or the PhoneGap team <clears throat> is trying to make itself obsolete. Well, we're at a point where the browser now supports most of the capabilities that in the core Cordova plugins. So as we migrate those plugins to web technologies, the need for Apache Cordova completely disappears, except Apple doesn't support progressive web apps yet in Safari. So because of that, <clears throat> what happens is when you've got an app, you decide, you know, is, is the platform I want to target supported? Then yes, I just deploy the progressive web app. If it isn't, then I deploy in a Cordova app. Cordova app can go in the web store, the app store, and I can operate, right? And then again, once Apple embraces this technology, which they said they're going to do, um, they haven't said when, but apparently they're going to do it. And then once they do that, then I believe progressive web apps are going to be the way cross-platform mobile development is done, at least part of it, going forward. So let's talk about the future. Got to start with a disclaimer. <clears throat> um, these are my opinions. I could be wrong. I'm probably wrong. But regardless of what I say, this may or may not be what my employer wants me to say. <laughs> I didn't ask. They're all asleep. <laughs> so uh, in the future, People will continue to say silly things like Nick card, ATM machine, VIN number, PIN number, and DMZ zone. You guys don't get that? Thank you for finally laughing. Um, and then people are going to continue to convert acronyms to words. AJAX is an acronym spelled with all capital letters. And by the way, to my point earlier, it's Jason. It's just Jason. It's not Jason. It's Jason. Just the name Jason. OK? Let's not make things more complicated. Jason. It's just Jason. <clears throat> I have a colleague, I, I go, I yell radar at her across chat every once in a while. Because it's an acronym. Radar is not a word, it's an acronym. You guys know what laser stands for? Anyone? Anyone? Light amplifying. Light, light amplification. Amplification. By. by uh, what I'm doing right now, I'm stimulating you. <laughs> stimulating. Of emitting emission. Emission. Of. Radiation. Radiation, yes, thank you. Uh, Blackberry to you. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, so going forward, pass all the humor. Going forward, native apps um, will continue to be done natively. I'm sorry, they'll continue to be hard to make, okay? But there will always be a need for those types of apps. So fast performance, large data collection, um, highly interactive apps, there's still going to be a need to do things in native. Um, there's not going to be any convergence technology-wise. Apple and Google are not going to meet, have a few beers, and decide to adopt the same technologies. Okay? So no matter what, going forward, you're using multiple tools and multiple technologies to build native apps. Okay? When someone's paying you by the hour to do that, it's a good business. <laughs> but when you're spending your own money to build mobile apps, not so good. And then hybrid apps. Um, web apps are going to continue to get native capabilities. Apple will eventually add support for PWA. Once they do that, hybrid apps essentially disappear, except in extreme cases. The extreme cases are when I want a web app, and I want that web app to use some a, a native API that's not exposed as a web standard. I'm still going to need Cordova and that JavaScript to native bridge to do that. But if you have some funky Bluetooth scanner that you want to use, some external printer, you want to interact with some sensor in the environment, it's going to be a really cool, compelling way to do that. And you'll be able to spin up a web app using a plugin to do that a lot faster than you can spin up a native app to do it. And then finally, I was lying about 250 slides, by the way. But you knew that. Finally, JavaScript-driven native continues to bloom. And so React Native basically is going to win, we believe. And I actually say that as we, because Microsoft. Did you guys see Peter's presentation yesterday about uh, Skype? So Microsoft is 
is rebuild Skype using React and React Native. We even created an um, open source tool that sits above the two of those and allows you to write once, and then <clears throat> at build time, it then either gives you React or React Native based upon the target platform. How cool is that? Did I mention it's free? All right. Um, Native Script and Lite will continue to be valuable to enterprises, although I think React Native is going to win. And then I think what's going to happen is design, designer tools and the tooling used to build and compile and so on are going to continue to be more robust. Because the, the tooling space is absolutely amazing today compared to what it was 10 years ago, compared to what it was five years ago. Although I'm really nervous about something. Okay, I, started, I said this earlier in my session today. Um, when I grew up, there was no Windows, right? We, everything was in the command line. And Windows was so cool because it got us out of the command line. And so now in the 2000s, what's the first thing we do with developer tools? Back to the command line. <laughs> Um, so cross-platform just basically gets easier, okay? Again, native, when you need native, um, cross-platform when time to market and budget matters because the cross-platform tools, because they deliver native apps, are going to be a better alternative for a subset of the applications that are built. Uh, that's it for me. My name is John Wargo. I work for Microsoft. I have one minute for questions. Thank you.